Hey, what's up, folks? I try to refactor my projects about every five years or so. And code refactoring is the process of restructuring a code base to make it more efficient, improve the design, make sure you're using the best current tooling and the best current software engineering best practices. And I also use that opportunity to make minor improvements, which technically is not part of a code refactoring, but you're in there anyway. So I do that as well. The current release of the Quality of Life Explorer, which is one of my projects, was from 2016. And it was due for a refactor. And I finished that. And the code is out there if you want to use it. I just want to talk a little bit about the refactoring and the kinds of minor improvements I try to make when I'm doing a code refactor. So this is just a high level view of the results. The size of the app went down by about two thirds. And this was accomplished at, when I say the size of the app, I mean everything. The variable size went down by about two thirds. The JavaScript being delivered went down to by about two thirds and the CSS went down by about two thirds. And that was accomplished using a couple of different things. For the variables, those are stored in JSON files, JavaScript object notation. And the, this is a text-based format. So you shrink text-based formats by getting rid of stuff in the text file itself. Now, what I did there is I basically, the way it was before is kind of set up like a GeoJSON feature properties where it was an array of objects with the column names repeated. So the ID is one and each year would be another one for every record in our geography. I switched that out to a JSON object that has a year's a key, and that contains an array of the years. And then each record is just the neighborhood ID as the key, and then an array of each, pro each uh, value for that given year. So if there's three years, there'll be three elements in that array. So that knocked the file size down a whole lot, which is awesome. The JavaScript savings was done in a couple of ways. One, I'm, I'm using better tooling now. It's using Vite and Svelte. And it's, though it just makes small, Svelte just makes really small stuff. Before it was using Vue. Before it's also using this uh, Material Design Lite Vue styling framework, which was a little bit JavaScript and CSS heavy. So I got rid of that and I'm just using just plain old Svelte and Tailwind for the CSS. So the JavaScript went way down. Also, which helped it go way down is I moved it to a mono repo. Before I would have the Quality of Life Explorer was a repo and the data was a repo and the print report was a repo and the embed map was a repo. And that led to a lot of code duplication, as you might imagine. Now it's one mono repo and that means there's Everything's sharing the same code and it's just a lot smaller. The Lighthouse results for that, you see performance went way up, way, way up. And there were a few accessibility improvements I made as well. So as far as code refactors, this went fantastic. So I'm very happy about that. Now, some of the minor changes I'll show you is first we've got in the old dashboard you had this gigantic splash welcome to the quality of life explorer thing and please know i lost a battle here this was a dumb idea this thing is terrible all this thing does is give you this text which is like an in inch away over here and then it says exploring the neighborhood character economics education and get it's just repeating the text you find an inch over here. So it's literally just repeating the text right around it. It's, it's, it's just terrible. But that's, this is somebody's on the project hill to die on. So what I did is I made it just a simple little styled alert box up here that goes away after automatically after the first time you see it. So we re refresh this page. You'll, you'll never see that again for that user on that browser on that machine just gets stores uh, variable and local storage to key that flag. The next thing I did is I made a lot more significant 
white space. The function of white space or negative space in design is it just reduces the visual clutter and the cognitive load. So it, it does that by having the user see less amount of text and functional elements all at one time. It gives the design some space to breathe. Before it was just uh, wall to wall stuff. Now I'm adding some reasonable page size bandering and some extra spacing. So it just feels a lot more open. It's a little less overwhelming to the user. Uh, there's now also a tutorial video uh, voiced by Samuel Shopper. L. Jackson or equivalent. I've been low key begging for one of these forever and uh, I didn't want to make it myself because I didn't want to play like Steven Spielberg to you know, like, can you move this? Can you move that? Do that? And every time you have to re-record the video, do not want to do that? I just got tired of waiting and I made one. I'm just going to tell folks on the project that if you can make a better one, please do so and we'll use that. So that's a tutorial video. I highly encourage people to make these even if you're like camera shy and talking on a microphone shy and just 30 to 120 seconds on how do your website helps people out a whole, whole lot. And a video is just the best way to do that because you're describing how to interact with something. And it's best to do that in a video. So there's now a tutorial video, which is nice. Uh, the map legend has seen some upgrades. So the map legend over here, just some select some stuff to so see what that looks like. Uh, way, the way we had it before, and keep in mind, everything about this legend was like hours and hours and hours of negotiation. But you can get to stuff like this, where it's extremely wordy. There's a lot of repeated text. It's all in the same color. There's nothing that far above anything else in the visual hierarchy. It's just... From usability point, it is very hard to read and absorb. Now it is much more compact. I mean, things are actually larger in terms of fonts, but go to that same variable. See, it's much more compact and you have color to separate things out. And this color is shared in the charts. So the county value and the selected value share the same colors. So it all kinds of flows together. So that was an improvement. Also, these breaks are now accurate, which is good. Um, in this version, we're using Jenks natural breaks, which as you add uh, elements to sort data points, Jenks just gets logarithmically slower. And we found about three years is reasonably all you could get. After that, the browser will literally just lock up <laughs> for quite a while while it computes that stuff. So what we did before is we'd do a jinx on three years, and then we would fudge the top and bottom buckets with the minimum maximum value of the whole data set so nothing would fall out. Uh, it's not great. Now we're using CK means, and it is a much faster algorithm, and we can do the whole data set. So that's good. That's the kind of thing users won't notice, but I'll sleep a little bit better at night. The charts have been upgraded. This is a new charting library. It's using Apex charts, which is quite nice. It's much more interactive and clean, and it has download options. So you can download the chart as an SVG or a PNG or the data that made the chart as a CSV, which is quite nice. Speaking of downloads, you can also now download the data that you're looking at. Previously, we had one big zip file you can download, which is fine. I mean, it had a shape file in it and a gigantic Excel file with multiple pages. And it's like, you know, good luck putting it all back together. Now we're looking at, say, energy consumption for electricity. You can download that data as a CSV file, as GeoJSON. You can download just the selected as CSV or just the, the selected as GeoJSON. So that way you can get directly at the data in a format you can use with any common like Excel or, or QGIS or, or whatever you want. You can get directly at the data, which is very nice. So gosh, what else did I do? 
Uh, the, the print is improved. I go over to the print. Now you can toggle on and off anything. Like you can turn off the cover page. You can turn off the map. You can say, just give me the map. You can say, just give me the data tables. But let's say I only want character and economy. Now the report's much more customizable and you can get just what you want. Did I, oh, one other change I made is it's now properly using the history API in the browser. So you could select a bunch of stuff and then unselect a couple and then change metrics a couple time and select a couple more. And you can, this is all stored in the hash. And the things being stored are the selected set and the metric you're on. So we can go back and it will walk us straight back through the history, including adding and removing stuff and changing metrics. And we can walk forward back through the history, doing all the things we just did, which is quite, quite nice. So those are the changes that I made. Um, now, as you can see, if, if you're used to using the old site, everything is still pretty much in the same place and works the same way. So it's not going to freak people out. The idea behind a code refactor, typically you wouldn't change anything about the UI, but yeah, you learn new stuff as time goes on. You, you make some little improvements here and there. The one big thing I changed is this stupid chart here, this data distribution chart. This chart is the data visualization equivalent of a hate crime. And it's for, for a couple of reasons. One, it combines a line chart and a point chart and an area chart with five different areas into a single chart. And whenever you combine that many chart types in one chart, you're, you're making a mistake. It is extremely hard to interpret. The points mean something. The dashed line means something. The area color means something. The area height means something. And the area width means something. There are five different things that mean something in this chart. I actually, for fun, I showed it to a few of my colleagues at work and asked them specifically, what do these five different things mean? And nobody could get them all right. So it's, it's just awful in terms of usability. It's also, nobody shows data distribution this way. You will not see a chart like this anywhere else in the universe. And this violates Krug's first law of usability, which is don't make me think. This is, you, you do data distributions in a histogram like a normal person. You, you don't do it like this. So that's a problem. And the, the third problem was, is this charting library, it's using Chartist and that's a dead project. It's last seen an update seven years ago. It already requires kind of hacking the Windows uh, global object with some extra stuff to even get it to work now. It's, uh, it's basically a dead project. And the reason why I picked it out is because it's one of the few ones that can make this crazy, crazy chart. So that had to go. Instead, what we've got is just a traditional histogram with a slight little addition. You see the frequency across 10 bins, but you can also see the selected frequency. So if you've got selected stuff, you can see where that falls in the distribution and that changes it's showing the distribution for the given year you're on. So you can see how that stuff moves around. Now, personally, I would just throw this chart out entirely. Histograms are not very, you don't see them outside of academic sort of stuff very often. Uh, I don't think it has a lot of utility, but again, when you're doing a code refactor, you don't want to make night and J kind of changes. So we got that. So that's the results of the refactoring. It's in terms of performance, you can feel the performance difference. It is just everything is so much faster. It's just, uh, I guess you'd call that frame rate. But being so much smaller 
it's less for the browser to download, it's less for the browser to deal with. It's, it's just a lot faster and better. Now, I moved this to a new GitHub repo because everything is different. I mean, it literally went from view and view CLI to spelt and Vite. So everything's different. I just moved the whole thing to a new repo. Plus it's a mono repo now, so everything's different. So I'll put a link to that. And because it's a mono repo, it's much easier to get started now. You just get clone and npm install and npm run pre-build, which uh, converts the data and you're good. So hope you enjoy that. Code refactoring is um, an opportunity to take an honest look at yourself from a period of time ago. And uh, it was, ah, what's his name? The coding horror guy and the Stack Exchange guy. Ah, Jeff Atwood. I think that's his name. Uh, once said, the worst code I've ever seen is the code I wrote six months ago. And that's always true. And I find that to be very true, but you shouldn't view that as looking at your old stuff in embarrassment. You should look at yourself with a little bit of pride that you've grown so much over that period of time that you can now do things a lot better. So code refactoring is something I recommend everyone do just to keep their projects healthy and the best they can be. And the code refactor on the quality of life explorer went extremely well. Usually in a code refactor, I don't see an app shrink by two thirds like this. Usually it's just uh, some different JavaScript tooling is, is now widely available in browsers. You can clean things up, make things a little better here and there. And this is like a night and day improvement. So. So I talk about it and I will point you to where that code repo is if you're interested. And I hope everybody's safe and healthy and happy and doing well. And we'll catch you later. Bye-bye.